Good morning, everybody. So my name is David Ordoño. I teach here at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and I will moderate uh, this panel entitled, as you can see, Global Peace in a Polarized World, How to Revive Ethics in International Relations. Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished panelists, uh, Melissa Park, Executive Director of ICAN, former Australian Minister for International Development, Corinne momal Manian, at my right, Executive Director of the Kofi Annan Foundation here in Geneva. Hint Bint Abdul Raham Al Mufta, she's permanent representative of Qatar to the United Nations Office at Geneva. And Miroslav Tserar, Professor of Faculty of Law, University of Ljubljana, and former Prime Minister of Slovenia. As a policy dialogue event, we really aim to have a dynamic and engaging conversation with our panelists, offering substantial reflections and solution-oriented recommendations. Let me tell you a little bit about the modus procedendi, what is going to happen next. I will ask the four panelists three vast, broad questions, and deliberately so. They will reply to each of them, uh, one after the other, for two or three minutes maximum, and then I will let the panelists have a conversation on each of these questions uh, for a few minutes, and then I will move to the second and third questions. And then we will have enough time to, in the end, to open the floor uh, for questions and answers, as explained before by my colleague. I remind all of you that the title of our panel is Global Peace in a Polarized World, How to Revive Ethics in International Relations. And my first question is really uh, broad, vast, and in a way simple and difficult at the same time. And since I was uh, born in a completely different era, in a different century, where everybody kept saying that the world was very polarized. I just wanted to hear you on the difference between yesterday and today, and what would be your def definition of peace? What is the difference between peace and global peace? And if you think that this is an ideal that we should strive for, that will never be achieved, but we have to fight for, it's worth fighting for, engaging for, or if this is something that can really be achieved. Corinne. I will start with you, <laughs> and then I will reverse the order for the second question, please. I start, I come from the same era as you do, uh, Davide, I think, and I remember the polarized world, and I can tell you it didn't feel as dangerous or as, um, as fragmented as it is today. So I think in this very room uh, a few months ago, Filippo Grandi, gave uh, what is known as the Kofi Annan uh, Geneva Peace Address, which is an annual address. And he started, uh, he's the High Commissioner for Refugees, of course, and he started his address by saying, we live again in a time of war. So I think we are defined now, our era today is defined by war. Uh, it is the highest number of conflicts around the world since uh, the end of, uh, of World War II. And, uh, a quarter of humanity lives in a, in a conflict-affected uh, country. So I think we have to take just a moment, a pause, and realize that, I mean, for people like us, we may have grown up in a polarized world, but we grew up also believing that we were overcoming war, war that war was mostly something of the past, and it may have been very naive. So we now are right in the middle of a time of war. And these are conflicts that are more severe in terms of civilian death than many in the past. They are longer conflicts and they are waged in a way that shames us all, um, especially since we just um, commemorated last week the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions, but the way that conflicts are, are waged today uh, make a mockery of the Geneva Conventions. So I'm not a gloomy person at all, by the way. I'm quite an optimistic person normally, but I think we have to really face reality that this is, yes, a polarized world, but it is mostly a fra fragmented, violent, and unruly world. Miro. Well, first, uh, I would like to thank you for the invitation. 
Then about the notion of uh, peace, maybe I would say that it is of course an ideal which cannot be uh, reached uh, in our lives in this world, but maybe in transcendence, yes, but this is another story, more philosophical, spiritual. Uh, I can say that externally peace actually means absence of violence, absence of uh, physical conflict of wars, but internally it is a state of mind. So even if you have peace at the external level and we are not at peace uh, with ourselves, if we are, uh, let's say, uh, if we live in fear, if we have other uh, conflicts within ourselves, we are not living in true peace. So it is very important to work on both levels, uh, of course, and we will be talking more about this external level today. Secondly, I would like to say that um, uh, if you have such a noble goal uh, like peace, uh, which is a clean goal, you must also employ uh, clean methods, clean tools, uh, so to say, to take the very clean path toward this goal, if you want really to keep it like that. Because if you take a muddy road, uh, then you will bring some mud to the goal and the piece will uh, transform into something else. Maybe for some time uh, you will uh, reach some peaceful situation, but then uh, something uh, Worse will follow uh, definitely. So, in my view, uh, it is very important that we not that we do not think uh, in terms of fighting for peace. I mean, sometimes, of course, we fight. We do all we can. We strive for peace in in all uh, ways we can. But physical fighting is not something that can bring lasting peace. It is a wrong approach. And this is why it is so important that uh, world leaders of all kinds, not just political leaders, but also others who have influence and impact on the people, uh, on, the pop on the world population, should learn about this more. And this is why education, not just for children and youth is so important. We all must educate ourselves with uh, more knowledge, with more holistic knowledge about these issues because only if we, we understand that uh, peace can be, let's say, in a relative way, achieved more successfully and uh, broadly, um, we have to be less violent. We have to learn how to uh, listen to others, how to uh, have more dialogue, how to uh, non nevertheless, uh, even uh, step sometimes step uh, step back a little bit to allow for space uh, which would bring more harmony because peace basically is harmony okay i will stop here now okay yeah. thank you Lisa? thank you to me uh peace is a child in gaza being able to go to sleep um, with a full belly looking forward to the future and without having a fear that they and their entire family will be wiped out in a bomb on their house. It is every child being free of war and the scourge of nuclear annihilation. In this time of increased confrontation, uh, militarization and proliferation where the risk of use of nuclear weapons has never been higher, um, it's, it's uh, reminding me of uh, what Einstein said when he was asked, uh, but what would be the weapons of World War Three? He said, I don't know, but the weapons of World War Four will be sticks and stones. In 1947, Einstein and his uh, fellow atomic scientists, including Oppenheimer, established the Doomsday Clock, an annual assessment by scientists about the proximity of humanity to annihilation. Uh, this year, they set the hands of the doomsday clock at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest we've ever been to global catastrophe. Uh, based on the twin existential threats of uh, firstly, nuclear weapons, and secondly, the environment crisis. Um, so this is an issue for the collective security of humanity. Even the uh, P5 of the Security Council, all nuclear armed states acknowledged 
uh, in 2022 that a nuclear war can never be fought, can never be won and must never be fought. Yet, uh, in an uh, astounding uh, failure of leadership and ethics, they cling on to their nuclear weapons uh, and they promote the false message that these weapons of mass destruction are keeping us safe and secure when they manifestly are endangering all of us. Um, the second thing I want to say about peace is that, um, similar to, to Miroslav's uh, view, is that um, peace is about understanding that everything is connected, that people, animals, all of nature are connected, and that there's a natural balance that must be respected, um, that what we do to others, we ultimately do to ourselves. Um, and this is something that Indigenous peoples around the world have always understood. And tragically, they are the ones who have been the primary victims of more than 2,000 nuclear weapons tests around the world, uh, of which successive generations are still suffering the catastrophic health and environmental consequences. Nuclear weapons are the only devices ever created by humans that have the capacity to destroy all complex life on Earth. Um, it's no accident that uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, has said that uh, nuclear weapons must be eliminated, that, that his number one recommendation in his new agenda for peace is the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, the, the elimination of nuclear weapons must be seen as an essential part of respecting and protecting the planet, the climate, humanity, and all living things. And uh, it must be a part of ensuring a sustainable peace. Thanks. Thank you. And Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Let me start by answering the question of global peace. To me, peace is not only about the, uh, the absence of war. Also, I agree that we are living in, I mean, we are living the war and witnessing on a daily basis. But it's also the absence of inequality and injustice, which unfortunately, yes, we are living in a polarized uh, world, but we are also witnessing on a daily basis a double standard when it comes to human rights, when it comes to environmental uh, change, climate change, and all these other issues. And we are living also in a very politicized world. Needless to mention examples, I'm sure that you can see it based on the daily uh, lively killing of people in Gaza and how do they suffer on a daily basis, not only killing soldiers and militants, but also innocent women, children, journalists, patients, doctors, and so on. And this all while the whole world, global community, the global civil, civil, uh, civilization watching such murder without even taking any actions, including the UN Security Council. Now, this is how to do with, with, the, with the global peace. Now, if I may go back a little bit in order to reach also the global peace to, to elaborate a little bit about the ethical questions. Indeed, we have to ask ourselves, how do we live? And, and this is actually Socrates questions. And just to let you know about that, the Prophet Muhammad, when he, when he started uh, as a messenger, he, he, was, he said, I was sent to perfect the good ethics and morals. But when we ask ourselves, how can we do that? What kind of morals do we have to follow? What kind of ethical standards we shall choose? And indeed, is ethics and peace is about choice? Let me share with you this scenario, and I will leave you know, I will leave it to you to think about. Let's say uh, my mother is sick, and I cannot afford her medicine. So I work in the, in the pharmacy. I take some medicine where the managers even will not notice if it's been taken. Am I a thief? Am I a bad woman? Or am I a good daughter? and rescuer and, and uh, hero. Answering the, the, the piece itself, it has to do not only with whether it is my, my choice, my decision is ethical or unethical. It has to do about the surrounding community, the social arrangement, the politics, the regulations, and so on. And then we have to ask ourselves, why such a, what's wrong with this community that will leave this patient, this woman who cannot afford her medicine, 
leave her alone, and then we, we judge her or we you know accuse her that she's a thief or that she's a stealer. So it, so going to the to the piece, it's all about we cannot do it individually. It's need a collective action from governments, from international institutions, and so on until until we as and uh, we as uh, as individuals. It has a lot to do with rules, regulations, the systems and institutions, the whole system where we are living in. Going back again to the global peace uh, question, yes, I agree with all of you what you have said. We are really living, if I may say, crazy world. It's not only about world, but it's all about different pol polarization. But the, probably the, 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 the two phenomena that you, that you mentioned and how it's really affecting our lives when it comes to peace. The, the invention of, 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 of nuclear weapons and how it's really impacting our lives. And then the interdependence economic ties that will affect our sovereignty as, as, as individuals, of our sovereignty as countries, because the, 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 the internal public policies and even the external is not limited anymore with, within, within our borders, geographical borders. Because at some point, as, as a sovereign country, I'm enjoying my sovereignty, but at some point I find myself by force, no choice, that I have to accept cooperation with international forces because I'll find my, my demand, my whatever, it's been met by external forces. So I, in this case, we are talking about global peace and how we are supposed to, uh, uh, it's all about international uh, cooperation. I hope I didn't exceed my time. Thank no, you. No, 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 it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> and before getting back and trying to trigger the conversation between the four of you, I, I would like to start by the word of the prophet and the idea of perfecting which is this idea of uh, striving for uh, peace in this particular case and global peace, which resonate with me uh, an awful lot. And I thank you for bringing this uh, into the conversation. Uh, and Miro, you also re refer a couple of times to the spiritual part uh, of, uh, of things in, uh, in, in your initial statement. But I also uh, saw a number of um, uh, complementarities in the things that you said, because for instance, Mira and Melissa, you, you refer to uh, balance and harmony. And I was also very struck, or maybe not so struck by the fact that the four of you in different ways also refer to the planet, climate, environment uh, a number of times. Um, and this is something that struck me. And I also saw, uh, in, you know, uh, complementarities or points of convergence between what Melissa and you, Corinne, uh, said, paradoxically, while well, bringing up the nuclear threat, uh, uh, there is uh, something which might not be easy to understand for younger generation that have not my age, uh, Paradoxically, these ultra polarized, very nuclear world I grew up with, and some of us grew up with, um, seem to be working towards peace. But you repeated a number of times that today we live in a more dangerous world, which is fragmented. So I was wondering whether it is. Uh, the fragmentation, which is a fundamental obstacle to anything uh, like a um, ideal uh, global peace, and I let you interact uh, as freely as possible. Who would like to start? Green. I don't think it's the fragmentation itself that is the most threatening. I think what is the the biggest threat is the lack of uh, ethical leadership. Because we have lost, uh, we seem to have lost all sense of uh, decency and humanity. And I think uh, the best way to uh, work towards peace is to regain the sense that we are all working towards, that this is not a zero-sum game. In many ways, the Cold War was a zero-sum game. And yet, at some point, the uh, big powers were able to join forces for some bigger causes. And at the moment, I really see whether it's the in the United Nations or other fora, I really see this mentality of zero sum game really regaining uh, uh, ground. And there is something that um, Kofi Annan said, which I think really symbolizes what we should be striving for. He said, we must all share the, we must share the pain of all those who suffer and the joy of all those who hope. And I think if we manage to regain the sense of what is it that we are looking for as human beings, 
then we're back on the right path. So it's not so much the fragmentation, but the fact that we are maybe uh, so much enamored with power that we have lost uh, this sense of, of profound humanity that we share, all of us. Okay. Um, first of all, um, when we talk about uh, how to revive ethics in international relations, uh, it somehow implies thinking, this, this implies thinking that there was more ethics before. I mean, now, you know, we have 8 billion people around the world and a um, lot of technology. And we have this impression that uh, we are more developed society. But basically, you know, uh, our civilization is still at a very low moral level. Uh, it hasn't made much progress during the history we know, although there are some good things I will mention uh, before, uh, later. So uh, we must be realistic about that. Uh, just in the last century, we started two world wars, followed by the Cold War and several other wars. The last one in the Balkans, in Europe, now we have Ukraine, etc. Not just uh, elsewhere in Africa, Asia, so also in Europe. I mean, it started here in a civilized Europe, etc. So we must be very careful about ourselves. We're morally still uh, very low. And that's why knowledge is so important because it is a long run, uh, I would say project. If you want to have more peace and more ethics generally, you have to start with education. And the leaders, as you said, ed ethical leadership is very important because if you don't have role models among the leaders, then it will not work. On the other hand, We've made some substantial progress in certain ways. For example, human rights, doctrine, practice, uh, the concept of the rule of law, uh, modern democracy. These are some uh, modern achievements which brought about more, I would say, more ethical society, at least to some extent. But of course, we, are, we have our ups and downs here. And I agree that we are on the brink of a great war uh, today if we continue like this. So we urgently need to um, do something. And I agree with uh, everybody here. We are much, very much in harmony about our arguments. But I fully agree that we need more ethical leadership. That means that especially political leaders should become uh, should should be under much more ethical surveillance. Um, there should be much more. Uh, I don't I don't know uh, this. Uh, uh, they should be pushed to be more ethical by the population, by media, by everybody. Otherwise, they will not perform. They will not deliver, and they should. I mean, we should find some new mechanisms, how to select our leaders actually, because, you know, if it, it, it's a lot about the personality, because if you're not ethical, uh, moral in, in yourself, you will not uh, deliver ethics around you. So it's very difficult. For this, reasons, uh, for this reason, we need leaders who are able, ready and willing, I mean, willing and ready to take any risk to perform ethically and also to be able to, as I said before, to make a step back sometimes. Because if you, if you just uh, follow your ego, uh, you will not be successful in uh, promoting and, or fostering ethics. In the last word, and I think that um, if you behave ethically in politics, you always lose sometimes, I always lose something. Mm. You sacrifice something of your own for the public good, for the mankind. But this is the necessary sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, because it is the nature of politics. If, if you behave ethically, you lose something, mm -hmm. definitely. Sometimes your position, sometimes because you are misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, in response to that previous comment, I have to say that uh, if you act ethically, 
you may lose something, but I think I, in the longer run, you only gain. You gain, you gain the respect of others, and most importantly, you gain and keep your self-respect. Um, I agree that uh, ethical leadership is paramount, as, as the old saying goes, the fish rots from the head. Uh, we need ethical leaders, and there's a, a scarcity of them on the global stage at present. Um, during the Cold War, we saw um, Gorbachev and Reagan uh, reach an historic agreement to dramatically reduce the number of nuclear weapons from around 70,000 to like, 12,000 today. And they almost agreed to eliminate them altogether. Well, we need to go further. We need to um, eliminate them altogether. We have a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that provides that pathway. Um, recent pop culture attention to nuclear weapons through uh, Oppenheimer, um, the new release of Godzilla, Annie Jacobson's best-selling book, Nuclear War, A Scenario, is giving us the opportunity to reach new audiences with the new understanding that nuclear weapons are a problem, they're not a solution, and that of all the problems out there, the global problems, this one is relatively easy to solve. Humans built nuclear weapons and humans can dismantle them. It just takes political will and leadership. Um, and I wanted to say that um, the, the Japanese peacemaker, uh, Daisaku Ikeda, said that um, nuclear weapons are not the problem per se, nor is it the countries that possess or develop them. The problem that, that we must confront is the ways of thinking that justify nuclear weapons, the readiness to annihilate others when they're seen as a threat. And so I do think as a species, uh, we have the capacity to choose dialogue over confrontation, the um, diplomacy over militarization, um, disarmament over proliferation. We have the capacity as human beings to create a new future that respects the earth and each other. Um, so, you know, I'm very hopeful that we can turn this around and I'll go into, you know, how we're doing that later. Thank you. Um, well, I believe we are all coming from different backgrounds, socially, economically, ethically, um, you know, ideologically and so on. So I don't know whether this is the right question uh, or sorry, the right argument or no. Uh, accordingly, we can say that when it comes to ethics and in international affairs, then do we consider that conflict as a natural phenomenon? Well, yes, because we have a differences among us. And yes, because conflict is also natural when it comes to international affairs, because every single country and state society, they have their own you know, perspective and so on. Perfection doesn't exist, so we need some kind of conflict. But even conflict, war has ethics, limitation of ethics, and has limitations as well. So that's why we need more of ethics in the international affairs, as my, my colleague um, has just stressed and mentioned. Again, I would say that um, uh, we need to think also about what are the main pillars uh, that when it comes to ethics and in international uh, affairs. I mean, going literature and uh, when it comes to the development of the literature and the practices even within ethics and international affairs over the last few decades, you can mention that international affairs today in such polarized world is not only about peace and security. Now it has to do a lot with the human rights, a lot with, you know, an intervention, you know, within... Uh, economics, uh, climate change, and, and, and other uh, issues, humanitarian, and also uh, refugees, gender qualities, and so on. So having said that, I believe that we need to focus on other, those pillars. I mean, basically I'm talking about the protections of the human rights. It, it, it is the nation's responsibility to be, to, be, to be in charge about protecting the human rights, not only within their own internal borders, but also whenever they are interact with external uh, forces. The second thing also, as, as uh, you mentioned also, the, uh, the environmental change, the climate change, and how nations are really, you know, also uh, responsible about perceiving those climate change issues and reducing their impact and the threats. Uh, and this cannot be done individually. It has to be within collective actions with other nations and uh, institutions. 
just uh, social justice. Uh, nations are expected also to work to creating more just and equality for their uh, people, but also for other nations whenever they have, you know, international uh, cooperation. Uh, also, humanitarian intervention, like uh, we've seen it for nowadays, within such conflict taken over, and you know, uh, we don't have the choice anymore. So, I mean that. The occupying countries or those conflict, you know, armed or whatever, they will refuse to cooperate with international. They have to do it without any options. So also nations are expected. In addition, also to the educational, the awareness, the training, more specifically of the potential future leaders. I mean, here we should invest more because they have to be more open to ethics and how to they limit their actions, specifically when it comes to international affairs. I thank you very much for this. I, I just wanted to, uh, the, it's the perfect segue because exactly my second question would have been to give uh, some policy oriented examples of uh, uh, where do we see or where, where, whether we do not see ethics in international affairs. And you have just given three, four examples of that. So I thank you very, very much. I will ask the same question if you can address. Uh, so really, what is the place of ethics in international relations, if any? And that I already know that for all of you, for all of us, there is a clear place for ethics in international relations. And you have already started addressing this particular question. And so if you, if you just like uh, Hing, could the rest of you uh, um, expand a little bit on some policy-oriented examples that have to do with your line of business, with your background, with your uh, uh, experiences as policymaker or, or, or specialist. Melissa, shall we continue with you? And then Nero. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I see ethics uh, in upholding international law uh, rather than um, some undefined rules-based order. I uh, see uh, ethics in um, supporting international institutions like the International Court of Justice. I uh, see ethics in um, promoting collective action for the common good through multilateralism. And I see ethics in uh, ensuring diverse voices are included and heard. Um, as an example, in the case of nuclear weapons, uh, for decades, the narrative around nuclear weapons has been controlled primarily by those who have them. And the message has been nuclear weapons keep us safe and secure. Uh, ICANN, uh, the organisation I work with, um, changed this by focusing the conversation on what would happen if or more likely when nuclear weapons are used. And it highlighted the real security impact of nuclear weapons by um, demonstrating the incontrovertible evidence from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, from the more than 2,000 nuclear weapons tests that have been carried out around the world, that nuclear weapons cause indiscriminate, catastrophic harm to humans and the environment across long periods of time and across vast distances. Um, we brought in um, the effect, affected community members to tell their stories before the international community. Uh, the Hibakusha from Japan and affected communities from around the world. Um, highlighting the real world impacts of nuclear weapons shifted the conversation from the theory that these things keep us safe to the reality of the horror that awaits all of us if uh, nuclear weapons are ever used uh, by design or by accident. Uh, we informed and empowered a broad range of stakeholders uh, not only affected communities, but um, scientists, academics, women, young people, uh, countries from the global south uh, to stand up and demand a policy shift. And that led to the uh, negotiation and adoption of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017 with the support of 122 countries. Now, this is an important addition to international law. Uh, and to multilateralism at a time when this is, these are increasingly under threat. It is the first time that nuclear weapons have been prohibited under international law. It is the only treaty that provides for victim assistance and environmental remediation. So it's not only a disarmament treaty, but it is a human rights treaty, an environment treaty, and a um, uh, feminist treaty. The treaty acknowledges the disproportionate harm on women and girls from nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and on Indigenous peoples. 
uh, it is democratizing nuclear weapons debate by taking uh, the debate out of uh, the hands of uh, the nuclear armed states, uh, including the, the permanent five and the Security Council, and bringing it to the General Assembly where every country has an equal vote. And that the process is participatory and inclusive uh, and the voices of affected communities are centred, uh, the voices of Indigenous people are centred. So it is, I think, the embodiment of what ethical leadership looks like uh, at the global level. Thank you. Eber? So I will not repeat uh, what we've just heard. I think that there is a lot of ethics in the world, in international relations as well. So. Uh, we must not be too pessimistic about that because, uh, you know, the quantity of ethics in the world uh, is still bigger than uh, the evil part, you know. Uh, it's always like this, but we are most, we mostly see the bad things, you know, we comment them, the media, of course, inform us about them and then we get this impression, but uh, uh, we must not be too pessimistic. Uh, uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, there is a lot of space to improve, for improvement. And uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, ethical leadership, of course, yes. But, you know, we must not forget about the people as such, uh, about us, because there can be no ethical leadership. If there is no corresponding effect on the side of the population. So if, if the people don't understand, if they don't know what is ethical, if they are not willing to adapt to ethical uh, ideas. And so the leaders are um, without any power to do this. Now, if you are dic a dictator, you can do many ethical things, but usually dictators don't. I mean, but if you are a democratic leader, you need support. You need uh, support by the, uh, your citizens. And uh, they will not give you support uh, if you try to be uh, very ethical, because it will uh, go to the extent of their, uh, let's say, living standard. And so, for example, uh, you know, all our endeavors for uh, um, against gas emissions, against pollution, against uh, climate change. I mean, to to do something, it's very difficult. If you make some radical ethical uh, decisions. You will not be uh, understood. It will not be well accepted by the popular. You will lose your your. Uh, uh, they will, people will simply lose trust in the government. You will lose your position. You will not be able to to um, um, continue with your project. So, this is a very um, tangible relationship, especially in democracies. Uh, but of course, um, as I said, uh, is it, it had been said. Any such uh, attempt, uh, which brings some certain sacrifice on the part of the police politicians, leaders, will bring uh, uh, very good things, uh, very beneficial things in the long in the long run. So uh, it pays off. It is important, and this is crucial for the sur survival of the mankind. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Corinne. First of all, I, I just want to say uh, that Miroslav has pointed out, pointed something very important about the dialectic relationship between ethical leaders and their people, and the fact that uh, people must be encouraged, of course, to and must be given the means to select ethical leaders, but they must also hold their leaders accountable. And this is it's really difficult sometimes but it's it's really the crux of this relationship about it's not only about heroes who will lead us in an ethical way it's really uh, our responsibility as individuals as well to make sure we have the 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 right leaders but i want to give three policy uh, uh, oriented examples of ethics in international relations i think one is about uh expressing, manifesting solidarity in international relations. And I want to contrast what happens with HIV AIDS 30 years ago and what happened with COVID uh, just a few years ago. And the fact that, and I'm sorry if I always come back to Kofi Annan because that's part of my job, I mean, it's, it's, uh, but okay. you know, what, 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 what Kofi Annan did with 
with uh, setting up the Global Fund, which is based here, of course, in Geneva, uh, on HIV, AIDS, and, and TB, and malaria, was really making sure that everyone was collectively responsible for providing access to antiretroviral medicine to the millions of people in Africa who were dying from HIV AIDS. And he was able to bring people around the table, the big pharma, the community leaders, the political leaders in a way that nobody had before. And then you, you contrast this with the difficulties that WHO is having in negotiating a pandemic uh, um, treaty today it's, you know, they have to extend their negotiations month after month, year after, they're not getting there. There's not this sense of solidarity. So this is, this is it can be done, but I'm not saying this to bring people's morale down. I'm just citing actually positive examples. See, it can be done. The second is, is about caring. So not being indifferent again. What is shocking I find uh, today, someone pointed out recently that uh, what happened in Darfur 20 years ago and what happened in Darfur today. More people are dying in Darfur today than 20 years ago. I went to Darfur with Kofi Annan 20 years ago, but more people are dying today. Who cares? Who is talking about it? That, you know, the George Clooney was like all over Darfur and this, we must do this. Who is talking about Darfur today? Nobody's talking about it. More people are suffering. So you, you have to have a groundswell of of caring, you know, and and make sure we don't fall into indifference. And the and the the third um, and in in the case of Darfur again, I mean, you know, obviously things uh, fell apart later, but the international community came together. There was a, a peacekeeping operation and so on. And the third um, the third one is really about bringing back optimism. Precisely, uh, we need to have this sense that we can. We can do things together because our leaders at the moment are sort of depicting the inevit inevitability of war. You know, and they we're just like on a conveyor belt and there's nothing we can do about, fall. We, we can't fall off it. We are walking towards war and there's nothing we can, you know, so we have the, because it's inevitable, we have to prepare. So we have the highest military spending ever, you know, ninth consecutive year of, of increase in military spending, uh, according to the Stockholm Institute of International Peace Research uh, Institute. But, but we have to bring back the sense that we can work together. We have to, to show that peace actually works. There's a lot of excellent wo uh, work being done at ground level by different organizations, many of which are based here in Geneva, to, to build peace on, on the ground. So all this, but nobody is looking at that. And by the way, states are completely underinvesting. I mean, the, the funding for peace work has decreased tremendously. So we have to bring, bring back the sense that there is, we can make peace work. It, you know, we have fantastic example in the past of, you know, the, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres was recently mentioning how elated he felt when he was then, a Portuguese official when uh, Timor Leste became independent, and and I went to I went to Dili twenty years ago at the time of the of the of the UN uh, uh, intervention there, and there was this sense of optimism that things were going in the right direction. So solidarity, caring, and optimism, I think, is how we bring ethics back into international relations. Solidarity, caring, optimism, this is also something that I heard in, in different ways uh, in the words uh, of all of you. Um, I'm also struck uh, by the fact that the four of you uh, gave uh, positive examples, which is something that uh, I have a hard time uh, persuading my students to, <laughs> to, to see because, and I fight every day, probably like uh, the rest of you, uh, we, uh, I, I fight against this idea of uh, inevitability that you mentioned, which is uh, highly problematic, which I start seeing how it could be related to ethics. Another thing, and I starting, you know, taking away points that could be uh, useful um, in order to make sense of this panel and of this first time together this morning, is also the role of education and the idea that uh, it's not uh, a God-given leader that is going to, uh, you know, uh, 
make sure that things will uh, will not be inevitable. But this uh, and Miro, you you repeated a number of times the role of education, 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 uh, and and this is probably the only way in which uh, um, a po a given population that is exposed to uh, um, ethical principles will understand how an ethical leader behaves or does not behave and will take decisions. So I, I hear you on, on this, these points. Um, I also understood that there are plenty of areas in which, and Melissa, you gave a few examples of that, uh, ethics is nowhere to be seen at the international level. And, and this remains probably the uh, part of the work that uh, needs to be done. I mean, you're expanding on, on the nuclear example, that is, of course, something that you know extremely well. And, uh, and so maybe this is also uh, something that we could reflect on. The third question that I really wanted to ask you, which is a difficult one, and I, I, I realize that it's a bit unfair for me to ask this question to all of you, and I honestly admits that I don't have uh, an answer to it, is whose ethics? Corinne, <laughs> would you like to start? <laughs> I don't want yes, to put anybody yes, on, the, I do, on the spot. I do, thank but, you. Uh, no, no, I'm very happy to start because there is a whole school of thought that of course the current interna international order is based on very uh, on the very liberal Western dominated uh, uh, ideology. And I really want to push back strongly against this because the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Charter of the UN were drafted jointly by lots of people, including amazing, amazing women from the global South. So it's not a sort of European male idea of things. There were amazing women from the Global South that made sure that important things were included in, in this document. So, of course, there is a total and unethical balance of power in the United Nations that derives from its charter and the, and the veto power in the Security Council. But however, I think when... when uh, I, I really challenge anybody to read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or to read the Charter of the UN and to say, these are not my ethics, really. Because it's, you know, the human being wants peace. The human being wants good. The human being does not, intrins is not intrinsically violent. I mean, the society constructs violence, but it's not. So I really think we have... A, a multilateral system that needs to evolve because of the imbalance of power, because a lot of young people don't feel represented by international organizations today, and rightly so. However, the fundamental ethical, uh, ethical ideology, if you want, underneath it, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in particular, I think belongs to everyone, and everyone needs to own it. Uh, so that I, I really, I think there are very cynical people who are trying to push against these. And we see, for instance, there are norms that have been developed also over the 60, now nearly eight years of UN uh, um, norms for, for gender equality, for instance, uh, for, for women's empowerment that some countries are very cynically pushing back against today, saying these are not my, this is not my view of the world. Why should it be imposed on me? But I think this is a very actual, very cynical thing from some leaders, definitely not from women in the countries yeah. that uh, that they they represent. So just, I'm that's quite, a very, I'm very good starting point, this. but we, we, we can continue later on. Nero? Well, I fully agree that there are certain universal principles which should be followed by the whole world, by the whole humanity. But of course, the cultural relativism is a reality we're faced with. So no matter how we believe in this, what you've just said, uh, human rights, gender equality, non-discrimination, etc., 
there will always be nations and uh, religious communities and people who will not uh, uh, be, uh, let's say, uh, in compliance with this or will be very against it. And now, for example, uh, when we speak about gender equality, about legal equality in general, you have this concept in some religious, let's say, communities or countries of complementarity. Uh, men and women should be in a complementary relation, which doesn't uh, require uh, uh, an equal treatment for both. But this complementarity brings some harmony. If everybody does its uh, job, then everything is OK, because uh, we are helping each other. We are solidary. We are uh, you know, humane, etc. But it doesn't work in practice. So we've learned uh, from history it doesn't work. So that's why I'm a very uh, strong defender and uh, staunch supporter of human rights. Uh, because this is the civil civilization achievement, including gender equality, non-discrimination of all kinds, because the history has proven that uh, people always distort ethics and uh, good ideas, uh, noble ideas. And um, this is why I fully agree that we have reached certain international standards, especially within the international treaties uh, and uh, some other, for example, agenda 2030 agenda uh, is kind of an, a, a global agreement we should stick to. Of course, it, it is unrealistic. Of course, it, there is a big problem with the implementation. We heard it yesterday. But still, the goals there are noble, are good, are positive, ethically positive. So we have things defined. So now we have to deliver, and um, this is the problem because the human, uh, the, the gaps, the gap uh, between the ideal and uh, practice has always been uh, within the uh, uh, human beings uh, very strong. So um, um, I would finally probably uh, like also to uh, say that what we really need to learn besides uh, apart to, for, to all this we said is uh, how to respect how to respect everything around us people animals the rest of the nature and the world as such because if we start with this respect which implies some humbleness uh, implies some uh, let's say uh, 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 holistic approach to the world, uh, more sensitive, more respectable, then we will give enough space to start with, let's say, the revival of ethics. And I've seen when, whenever there was a respect between the leaders of the country I met, uh, when we were discussing uh, the respectful uh, level or let's say the results were much better. Uh, and um, I think that we should all, especially the leaders, but all the people as well, learn how to respect uh, this world and everything, because it, if it gives us uh, what we are. It enables us as such. So this is so important for, and this should be one of the universal approaches. Uh, we, we could all learn, uh, no matter what, the, the, I mean, apart from different backgrounds, to be more respectful. Okay, thank you. Um, just to come back to Corinne's uh, mention of Kofi Annan, um, I, in prior uh, time in my life, I worked with the United Nations for a number of years under Kofi Annan, and he was, you know, the perfect example of, you know, epitomizing, caring, um, compassion, solidarity, and optimism. And uh, in terms of optimism, uh, you know, there's an old saying that says, um, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. And so I think it is really important to push back against the inevitability of war, against the inevitability of the end of the world and so on. Uh, instead, we, we can imagine a different future and put that into, into action. Uh, and indeed, if we are to survive as a species and as a planet, 
we cannot wait around for politicians to make the necessary policy, policy shifts on the environment and in relation to nuclear weapons. We have to take the lead and we're seeing increasingly young people standing up, whether it's climate rallies, Extinction Rebellion, uh, and increasingly in, in terms of the uh, nuclear weapons abolition movement, they are seeing the intergenerational injustice, both on the environment crisis and nuclear weapons. Um, many, almost all of you, I'm sure, will have heard of Margaret Mead, uh, anthropologist's famous uh, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And civil society has had a long history of driving meaningful change. Um, and I think um, ICANN stands as a, as a, as a good example. Um, ICANN began uh, in Melbourne, Australia in 2007 by a small group of people sitting around a kitchen table asking themselves, what could they do to get rid of these weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, given that the nuclear armed states were refusing to disarm in accordance with their legal obligations under the non-proliferation treaty. And they decided to start a campaign based on the earlier successful campaigns against landmines and cluster munitions, whereby you prohibit the weapons and then they become morally and legally unacceptable to use. You're changing the norms. And, um, and so they did that. In 2007, they started this campaign. Within 10 years, they, uh, the, it's ba the uh, organisation was based in Geneva. It had hundreds of partner organisations around the world, and it had won the Nobel Peace Prize for its work in highlighting the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and helping to get a new UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons adopted. So um, I think that's a great example. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in, in, in terms of whose ethics, it's, it's all of ours. It's all of us. It's up to all of us. Um, ICANN is seeking to break down the silos where uh, only uh, nuclear weapons only get talked about in security and disarmament fora, and usually only by white male so-called experts. Um, when... When, when when nuclear weapons can destroy everything and everyone we love at every at any moment, uh, we all have a stake in this issue, and we all have the right to a voice on this issue. Um, uh, nuclear weapons are not separate from other global issues; they are deeply interconnected. They're connected to uh, human rights. What could be a greater violation of the right to life, the right to health, the right to a clean environment? They're deeply connected to health. Um, I had a meeting with Dr Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization recently, uh, who uh, very quickly agreed that nuclear risks are health risks, that, um, that in a, when there's a nuclear detonation, there can be no humanitarian or health response because health workers are mostly dead or injured. Infrastructure is all destroyed. Uh, and plus the uh, high degree of radiation in the air. So you're on your own in terms of uh, a nuclear strike. And um, when, where there is something that you cannot um, respond to, and this is why the International Committee of the Red Cross has always opposed nuclear weapons, uh, when there's something you can't respond to, you have to prevent. And the only way uh, to prevent this is the elimination, the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are also an environmental issue. Uh, the latest science in 2022 in the Nature Food Journal, uh, science scientists have concluded that even a limited nuclear war using only a fraction of the world's nuclear arsenal would uh, cause, would not only kill millions of people outright, but it would cause global climate disruption from the soot being ejected into the stratosphere and blocking out sunlight. Uh, leading to agricultural collapse and the death by starvation of more than 2 billion people uh, in, in a nuclear winter within two years. A major nuclear war would mean the end of human civilization and most other life forms. So this is an issue uh, of, you know, it's very deep, deeply a personal issue for all of us. Um, and, and it is an issue for, um, for leadership at every level. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, David, um, it's not who is ethics a question, it's simply because we are all coming from different perspectives, socially, religious, culture, and so on. Uh, you have your own ethics, I have my own ethics. And what is ethical to you might be unethical to me. And even for myself, what I used to believe it used to be ethics, like a few years ago, it might be unethical today. So it has so many criteria. That's why we cannot say that there is one ethical standard we have to follow. But it's all about, if you have your ethics, your ethics, your ethics, I have to accept it and respect it. And the same verse, the verse that you have to accept my ethics and uh, respect it. So it's all about respecting each other ethics because we are humans. But the, posit the good news is that we are, yes, we are living in a polarized world, <clears throat> but we have at least <clears throat> some, if I may call it, international efforts and achievements that are really remarkable when it comes to the work they've done, how to create and to base the essential ethics, if I may call it, like the, you know, the universal declaration of human rights, because we are all talking about the human rights as the base, basic of such ethics. In addition, we have a lot of multilateralism treaties and declaration that been also in including and engage in the ethics. So it's not about whose ethic we are supposed to follow because we have our, you know, our own differences, but it's all about respect and about accepting these ethics. But the, probably the, 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 the one point also is that I would like to mention is that having such multilateralism and have, having such, you know, international uh, laws, I think it's time to reinforce those multilateralism to, to, to bring back the power for them. We know, we, I mean, going through, when we are talking about this, this question, we can see some critiques, you know, how is the Security Council, how is multilateralism is polarized or, so, or, you know, the international, even like international criminal court and so on. But they've been established for the sake of mediating conflict and they've been established for the sake of have, having positive ethics in a way that it, not, it will not be forced for us because we like it or we don't like it. It will be forced, for, for, forced on us because we have to follow this minimum standard of ethics. And the last word I would like to say is you, youth, you are the architects of the future. You are the potential of not only changing the world, but also forcing ethics. Uh, you have to follow your ethics without any questions, but you have also to fight, as we've been saying, to fight strongly and to struggle for having the minimum base of your ethics so that definitely the politicians will be used. But also we have the other sectors of ethics when it comes to climate change, environment, stability, sustainability, and other uh, human rights uh, aspects. Thank you very much. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I've got the impression that um, the four of you in different ways believe that there is, at there is at least a minimum common denominator, uh, which might not be um, believing a, uh, in a single form of ethics, but there is something that we share, our common humanity, you can call it in, in, different, uh, in different ways. And if there is a mechanism that triggers uh, and makes sure that this principle thrives, and this is a word that many of you used multiple times, that's respect. So it's based on this very simple mechanism that this you know, common ground, uh, whose ethics in the end uh, might, uh, might be implemented. The second thing that I noticed, and again, Feel free to correct me, and maybe I got it very, very wrong. Um, none of you is a revolutionary. The four of you are reformists. Basically, you are telling us we do have a certain number of tools, certainly not perfect. They exist under different names. One is multilateralism, which is flawed, which doesn't necessarily work, but it's there as a good principle that we should cherish and nurture uh, in, in different ways. The tools exist. The Human Rights Declaration might not be perfect, but uh, it, it indicates, it paves the way uh, in a way or in another. And so uh, there are a number of things that are already in place, the International Criminal Court uh, and other, uh, and other um, treaties, institutions, and so on and so forth. Am I wrong? No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I, I, got, I, I, got this, I got this right. And this is probably uh, yet another takeaway point that I'd like uh, the audience to, uh, uh, to bear in mind. And now, as promised, we are, we are 11 minutes away from the end of our uh, session. And in a very Swiss way, I respect the allotted time. And I turn to you, 
Uh, and uh, we are going to open up the floor for questions. You've received them. And yes. please shoot them one after the other. <laughs> okay, I will do my best. I'm also trying to combine several questions because we've got over a dozen questions for less than a dozen minutes. So <laughs> we, will, we will do our best. Uh, first question, I saw a lot of discussion here from participants about the virtual world, AI and polarization. And so thinking about how does, uh, how does polarization kind of manifest right now and how is it different online versus in the physical world and how do they impact each other uh, with an asterisk that this could be a positive or negative impact. But this was one key question. Uh, and a second one I'll put in that maybe kind of connects to that and what everyone was last talking about as well was about conflict and how in a way conflict or even disagreement is something that's inherent when you have a diverse group of people because you have different definitions, different values. And so how do you think about the perception of conflict in, in how you define conflict and disagreement? How do you use this to build peace and harmony? Uh, how do you deal when people agree to disagree, when there are different ethics? How do you move forward? Um, and if the answer is respect, <laughs> please describe it, how, how to actually go through with that. And especially if an ethics is impeding on, if one person's value is, is impeding on someone else's, uh, which is not an easy question. So thanks everybody. Uh, so I'll stop there for now and come back if we have time, thanks. Or is open, and here I don't <laughs> indicate any any of you that wants to start. Miro, please, brave. <laughs> this came to my mind one thought about this uh, technology, artificial intelligence, uh, digitalization. As long as all this technology, including artificial intelligence, uh, the present point of development, is uh, our tools. Uh, it will just multiply our ethical or unethical uh, action. Behaviors. I mean, whatever we do, it will just multiply. So it will be used in military pur purposes, in, uh, let's say, in the health system to save people's lives, etc. So technology is just a tool in this sense. But if the AI goes beyond that, if it really becomes autonomous in a way, the real AI, then we are in a very great danger. Maybe the greatest, even the biggest danger so far, bigger maybe than totalitarian regimes or maybe even uh, nuclear weapons, because we will not be able to uh, rule over us anymore. We will just be uh, uh, left to the mercy of uh, machines <laughs> or this art intelligence behind them. So uh, this is a very big challenge. And um, I see that nowadays we are not able to follow all these uh, developments, uh, progress, we say progress, okay, mm. it's basically progress, technical progress by ethical means. Mm. We are la lagging behind. It happens so fast that we are really we must really do our best to at least follow this to prevent, uh, let's say, the very best scenarios. Yeah. So, thank you. Stop here. Not yeah. enough. Sure, sure. And I may uh, add, indeed, uh, if, uh, AI has been created, developed by humans. Mm. And hence, it can bring us back to the questions about what kind of ethical we have to use, what kind of ethics we have to follow or you know, to be standard. Uh, the good news is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very quite sure about this, is that the ITU is really working right now on having something which they call it ethical standards for AI. It's very difficult mission, by the way, because what is ethical when it comes to AI, like in the Asian countries, differs from African, European, and so, and so on. And the same thing, if I'm not mistaken, there is also a, a document called AI declaration, standard, ethical, something developed by the European Council. I looked at it, and it's really looked to be very good. I mean, however we put off standards for AI, we cannot control it because it's developed by a human. So it depends again to the ethics of the humans. There you go. Yes. yes please. Uh, going to the question about AI and its impact, um, I, I, 
I think um, obviously uh, it, it, we're seeing that there's um, a lot of misinformation and disinformation going on, uh, manipulation of social media, and this can, uh, this can obviously exacerbate divisions, uh, increase distrust in um, uh, international institutions, and um, it will um, distort perceptions of global issues. Um, <clears throat> the, in terms of the impact uh, in relation to nuclear weapons, uh, it obviously it increases the danger. I mean, nuclear weapons are already like an existential risk, but artificial intelligence applied to uh, nuclear weapons, which we're now seeing increasingly happen uh, in the military around the world, um, that is increasing the speed of warfare and decreasing the time for nuclear decision making. And that is very, very dangerous. Uh, it also increases the chances for um, accidents and miscalculations um, and increases the risk of cyber attacks, which I think no person, country, or organization has, man has a foolproof way against. Um, in terms of perception of conflict, um, I think there must always be whatever whatever um, perception one has, there must always be a willingness to to talk and to listen. And um, I think it's insane that there is no uh, significant discussions around a peace agreement for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, thousands of people are dying every day because there's no peace talks. And I don't understand why that's not happening. Um, yeah, so dialogue, diplomacy, I think they are tools that we have available to us that we can choose to engage with. And, um, and I need to see more of that. Well, obviously, I think we can only agree <laughs> with, uh, with this. And I'd like, because a lot of has already been said about AI, but I'd like to, to come back to this issue of conflict. I think that most conflict differences are natural and not necessarily bad. They are, what is bad is the slide towards violence, of course. So they're often, they're rarely, rarely some of the big violent conflicts we see are rarely about values. Mm -hmm. They are mostly about interests. So I think I think the ability of the international community to provide uh, trusted, neutral mediators that can that can uh, provide some kind of arbitrage among these these interests is what is lacking at the moment. But we we know how it's done. It's been done many times before. We know how it's done, and the the as awful as the Gaza conflict is, at least there is an attempt to, to negotiate, which there isn't in, in, in Ukraine, as you said. So we know how it's done. It's just a matter of investing sufficiently in those processes that have shown to work time and time again. There must be an understanding in a parties to a conflict that they have an interest in peace. Kofi Annan walked away from his role as special envoy on Syria, and he said the parties are not interested in peace. I cannot want peace more than the parties. So uh, there, is, there is a whole machinery. There's, there are experts, many of them based here in Geneva, in mediation and so on. It can happen, but there has to be a willingness of of the of the countries and people involved to want peace but just one very quick point sure. about revolution <laughs> as a french citizen i have a complex relationship with revolutions but <laughs> i think we've come to the point yes we have lots of tools we have mechanisms that work they have ground to a halt however there is a paralysis of the multilateral system we don't, we should keep it, we should not jeopardize it, but we do need a slight revolution mm. in the multilateral system. <laughs> we need profound changes. We need profound changes. Reform, 
will not cut it at this stage. Right. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we're going to stop here. Uh, let me wrap up, uh, first of all, by thanking uh, the four of you for uh, your inputs, your insights, uh, your reflections, uh, and what you brought to the table and for our reflections. I would like to say as a teacher of this institution where we're holding this, uh, this gathering, that we reintroduced philosophy and ethics uh, in, back in 2020, which had disappeared at the end of the Cold War to, to go back to this theme um, for a number of years. And this is our own personal or collective endeavor to make sure that ethics are uh, there, present, and we keep educating a younger generation of uh, future policymakers and that uh, you, uh, you pointed to them in before uh, so that um, this is going to stay uh, as present as possible and is as a, as a compass in their hands when they will leave the, the institute. This is how we very modestly contribute to the kind of conversations that we had this morning. And the last word that I would like to add uh, is something that I take away from your interventions this morning, which is a word of hope, uh, positive, moderate optimism, and fight against this idea of ineluctable end of the story. So once again, I would like to thank you all very, very much, and thank the audience. Thank you. Thank you.